So, yeah, so welcome to our uh, machine control focused event. So let's just get straight on with it then. So Gail McEwen. So Gail, you're a site, you were a site engineer. Um, you started life out as an excavator operator before you became a site engineer and site manager before becoming a trainer. So could you, you know, give us a bit of background? You know, what is machine control? How does it actually work? You know, how does the machine know where and what to dig? And what kind of skills do we do we need to teach site engineers to help them become comfortable with the technology? Well, basically, machine machine control can come in a couple, a few different forms. Um, basically, it, it integrates survey positioning equipment into earthwork machines, so like plants, so your diggers, your dozers, even rollers in some situations. So it can use GPS, uh, just like the way that we would use it on site, uh, using VRS systems as well, but it can also be incorporated with total stations. Uh, so you would use the total stations or the GPS to control your position or your levels on site. But you can also get it in the form of just a standard laser level as well. So, of course, that wouldn't have any effect on the um, coordinate positions of the machine, but just the levels of the site itself. <clears throat> so you would use the machine control more on bulk earthwork sites so you wouldn't use it um, for example maybe on a, a like a curbing job or, or something like that but you could use it in the basic digging out of a road box that sort of thing so where you've got um, bulk earthworks of any sort it, it can be used in that in that sense so the way it works is um, you have a model so you have a design model it doesn't always even necessarily have to be the right the final design model it could be interim models as well so for example it because if it's an earthworks job chances are you might be filling up in layers uh, rather than just going straight to the, fi the final design so you could um, have interim models as well loaded into the machine so it's just a case of the operator picking what model it is that they're, they're wanting to work to and the machine will guide them uh, on on either the levels or if you've got the GPS or the total, the total station. Um, it basically acts as a guide for the machine operator rather than them having to work to more traditional profile boards or, or batter rails. So the model has to be created, first of all, and usually it's created by the site engineer. Um, so there is a bit of a skill set that comes with that, which I'll talk about um, just, just shortly. Um, so you have the model itself, but the model could actually even be in some cases uh, designed by the operator themselves. It doesn't always necessarily have to be the site engineer. The operator can create a model, let's say, for example, like a, a water management swale that's at the last minute been identified that would, would benefit the, the area. And they've been asked to dig out a, a swale or some sort of water management system to control water runoff. The operator can do that from within the cab without having to wait for a site engineer to design it for them. So however the model, if it's done by the site engineer or if it's done by the plant operator, the model is then uploaded into the machine. Um, checks are carried out, of course, uh, which I'll come to again just shortly. Um, once the, the operator has is, is done the work or filled up to the correct level um, within the, the, the correct area, the, the, the operator can even do an as-built survey as well. So, again, you don't have to wait on the engineer to come out with a total station or a GPS to do an as-built survey. Again, the operator can just do that within the cab. Um, the survey can then be exported either manually or through a cloud-based system back into the office, let the site engineer make some edits, tidy it up, and that can then just be directly produced into the o and file or the health and safety file at the end of the project. So the model itself has to be referenced to some sort of coordinate system. Um, usually it's in, it's in the form in the UK, it would be the, the British National Grid usually. But on um, those of you that are familiar with GPS itself, in the more standard sense, you'll know that sometimes what we do is use calibration files, where it's a, a, a localised grid of control points so the model would be referenced to that set of control points. So the machine would then also need to know, well, what coordinate system am I working to? So it doesn't think that it's working to the, the global system. So it needs to know which system it's working to 
for the, the machine to understand what the model is actually telling them. So you mentioned there, Saffron, about the skills. And, and one thing that I've, I've been getting a lot of feedback on from engineers is um, they feel, or a lot of them feel, that this could potentially take the job away from the site engineer. It's one less thing for them to do. But it's exactly the opposite. It's completely the opposite to that. So, of course, not in, not in every situation. You might not have to go out and put profiles and batter rails out anymore. There's still even actually a place for them in machine control and um, for the visualisation of it for more senior managers that don't get to inter interact with the model, they might want to see it. But even if, you don't, if you're not in a position where you have to set out profiles and, and batter rails, there's still a, a whole different other skill set that comes with it. So the engineer has to be able to create good clean models that the you know so it needs to work if someone that doesn't have any skills or experience with let's say um dtm software digital terrain modeling software which is what machine control models are are, are made from you could find that there's a, a mistake in it so one area could shoot away up by about 500 meters and come back down it, would, it just wouldn't be right so the engineer or whoever's creating the models has to understand and have the right skills to be able to produce a good a good clean model but they also need to be able to check um, for mistakes so things um, even over time such as blade wear so a dozer is a or even the excavator is a great example of that of course over time again we're talking about earth parts projects here sometimes we're dealing with lovely um, soils and cohesive soils but other times we're working in rock so, of course, we know that when buckets or blades are working with rock, we can get blade wear on that, which can affect the levels that you're seeing on, on the controller. So the engineer has to be able to understand that and how to incorporate that into the machine itself to take that into account. But also another thing is troubleshooting as well. Um, the more skills and the more experience the engineer and even the operator has with the system itself means that they can carry out troubleshooting on their own without having to phone up the manufacturer or whoever it was that they bought the equipment from, which of course then frees up their end to carry out really important tasks for customers that, well, I'll let Alan probably cover that later on. Um, but yeah, troubleshooting is a, a massive one. Um, as I say, I mean, I mean machine control is, is by absolutely not taking away the engineer's role at all. It's so important that um, the engineer's that are probably listening to this uh, this podcast understand that that it's if anything it, it it frees you up to be able to increase your skills in other areas and it makes you more effective and and um, focus in other areas of the business as well. So I hope that's answered answered your question, Saffron. Yeah, that's brilliant. Thanks, Gail. A lot of things there that I hadn't even thought of myself. So that no, that's really, really useful. Systems. So Steve helps plant companies and contractors with the procurement, the fitting out, um, and the optimization of the machine control equipment. So is this kit only reserved predominantly for shiny new excavators then, Steve? And you know, big road projects. You know, maybe you can dispel some of the, the common myths and con misconceptions around this and perhaps give us a couple of examples of where, you know, you've all had to come overcome initial resistance. Um, and, you know, at what point in the process would you say that the light bulb moment often comes on for, for your clients? OK, well, thanks for having me. And, uh, yeah, I'd be happy to uh, dispel a couple of myths. Um First up, yeah, I mean, the kit doesn't have to go on brand new shiny equipment. Uh, I think most brands now will will provide retrofit machine control, even, you know, 3D machine control kit. Um, I tend to focus more on the SME contractor, the owner operators, um, the, the smaller companies that are wanting to um, dip their toe into digital construction, but, you know, might need that extra bit of support and that bit of time and thankfully Leica let me you know um, invest some time in these uh, in these smaller companies um, so leading on to the question about is it just for big earthworks jobs no no I, I don't think so anymore um, 
people once they get used to it um, that people that have adopted it i remember one client saying um i'd set out a or i would i would dig out a five by five patio with machine control now now i own it and i know how efficient it is um but yeah i mean to a lot of people especially people that have been operating for many many years it's a it's a scary prospect and you know um i I like to drop back to a, an ex-colleague of mine and um, uh, a guy that converted to machine control recently, a guy called Murray Stokes. So Murray is uh, uh, a 35-year-in-seat uh, operator, both dozer and excavator, um, ex, ex-hawk. He's worked on some huge projects and tremendously uh, skilled operator. He's got efficiency ingrained into his dna when you see him operate a piece of equipment it's like he's part of that equipment so um i had a few conversations with um the the business uh, business owner that murray now works for and we decided to trial uh, machine control on their uh, d70 dozer now i know murray stokes so it was it was one of those um, trials that could go either way because because we're familiar with each other. I would have got a very honest report back from 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 Murray, and uh, he was skeptical and he was afraid that machine control would take away some of his skill. Um, and you know uh, what would be stopping him being replaced by somebody with half the experience and doing the same job? You know, it was just a, a scary prospect. So. Um, we went ahead and we uh, we fitted out this D7 with um, 3D machine control. I spent time on site showing Murray um, how to kind of what sort of views he could have on the on the screen. And initially, we put when we put the model on, um, you know, it was a, a, a standard DTM with all the triangulation and everything else. And Murray looked a little bit um, taken aback, and he just said, "Make it as simple as possible, please." So, uh, yeah, we stripped out the triangulation and essentially he was left with two rectangles, one at one grade, one at another. And, um, yeah, he set about just um, marking the perimeter with the dozer. Once he marked the perimeter, he could then see what level he was at, see what level um, the, um, the grade needed to be. And three days, I would say, he was completely converted that's that's how long it took for him to gain a bit of confidence in it and on day four the cut and fill was completed and the next task was to um install the drainage and install some um, ground source heat pipes so murray called me up and he he just said is there any chance of um putting the um the line work for the for the uh, ground source heat pumps on the dozer so i I kind of laughed and said, well, it's already there. I just stripped it all back. So your model was very simple. Um, quick visit back to site, turned the line work on for the uh, for the pipes. And he was then using a D7E to go around and mark out the site for the excavators to follow. The excavators didn't have machine control on. So he was using a D7E to essentially um, stake out the site. And this is a, an operator in his 60s, not long due for retirement, that didn't really want machine control because he was, as I say, a little bit scared. Um, but yeah, one week um, completely con- converted. And when when we asked him um, what he liked most about it, his um, his answer was trimming up or getting near to grade can be, you know, it can it can be very tiring. I mean, before we put machine control on this dozer, they were using a laser catcher. Um, so they had a dual grade laser spinning. Uh, Murray would have to operate the blade himself. And, um, you know, when you're trimming up and concentrating on a, on a large site, it can get very tiring. So he loved the fact that once he got close to, to grade, he could just hit the auto button and track. So you still need experience. You still need to know what you're doing with wind rows and things like that. You know, you still need to know how to read the, the terrain and the earth, but it just, it just, it's there to help. And, um, yeah, that's what he agreed at the end. It's just, it's not here to take your job. It's here to to help. And um, yeah, he's a, the perfect uh, shining example.
with um yeah just give it a go that that is a brilliant story Stephen a brilliant illustration I think you know, the more of these stories we can get out there. And I know that like, all of the main um, equipment providers are like working really tirel tirelessly to get this message out there. But I think the problem, um, one of the problems is it, th there's a lot of people who it would benefit, who it's, it's virtually impossible to reach through digital media because they just don't hang out in the same places digitally. Um, so, you know, hopefully there'll, there'll be, you know, be able to see these things, you know, coming out into the industry and see when other people are doing them, that, that it's, there's, there is nothing to be to be scared of and that, it, that there's so many benefits. So that's brilliant. Thanks very much, Steve. So Simon, Simon Hogg of 10 Star then is a machine control simulation specialist. So 10 Star offer a range of professional machine training simulators in the transportation, construction, agriculture and forestry sectors. So Simon, can you explain how does simulator technology work? What are the benefits of it? And how can employers access this type of training if they're wanting to use it to upskill their workforce? Yes, uh, thanks Saffron and hello to your listeners. Um, basically, uh, simulation, if you look at other um, industries, aviation, medical, military, uh, they've been using simulation for a long, long time. Um, and for some reason within construction, agricultural and transport industries, which is what we're involved in, uh, it's not that commonplace. And in particular uh, within construction. So what we do is we basically emulate an excavator or a dozer, both in its how it hydraulically performs, how it may sound, how graphically it may look uh, on, on the screen in the simulator. And we try to give the user the most realistic and immersive experience when they actually get onto a simulator. And these simulators can be fully enclosed with moving bases all the way back down to a, a simple desktop system, depending on the application and what we're trying to do. So a de desktop system might be something we take into a school, for example, where we're giving younger generation the opportunity to drive a 20 ton excavator and we're possibly trying to have them engage in, in the thought process and a career in this industry. We tend to use the moving base, the larger, more immersive systems, bringing in the virtual reality headsets when we're delivering professional training um, to operators. And this is where the machine control also comes in as an add-on to that. And what's interesting for me when I've worked in this industry, which is now nearly my ninth year of being in simulation within the UK, is... Um, I don't see a lot about the machine control being used in simulation. And I don't see a lot of machine simulation full stop, but I do deal with other parts within Europe. And uh, there's a particular college in Europe that run 19 of these simulators. And what's interesting is every one of these simulators, uh, it's mandatory that they have machine control on there. And, and the key reason from what I've understood from the user, our customer there, is that the contractors and the employers that would take these students insist that that's part of their training. They must be shown actually how to how to do this. Um, take it back to the UK again, and I think it's starting to occur. This is starting to come around, but then we have the question of mass adoption of machine control, which I'm certainly seeing now. We need to address the training issue, which is precisely when innovations like simulation come into play. Um, so I've personally participated in training with operators, and Steve mentioned earlier, an operator that may have been or is at the top of their game uh, but never used this technology and um, so it's a simulator is not just designed for someone learning how to drive the machine it certainly applies to someone that's learning about the attachment so it, it could even be a tilt and rotate bucket on an excavator in farming we talk about precision farming and crop spraying learning about that attachment and in construction the machine control um, so I've personally participated in the training with this, and it's probably fair to say a time-served operator wants to know why am I getting on a simulator? Are my skills not, not good enough? What's the issue here? What we're actually trying to do is give them some basic skills on the machine control, but we could also profile and screen where their current skill levels are actually at. So when we start to look at some of these large infrastructure projects uh, where we have mass adoption and many users on a site, 
we need to understand where those operator skills actually lie and also understand what we can do to fill the skills gap if there are gaps in these areas. And this gets very interesting. But also, because we're in a classroom, there are many more people that see this 20-ton excavator or doors are working. This generates a lot of questions and it creates a really good discussion. So when Steve was chatting earlier about models and simplification of it, this is exactly what I mean. So you may have a, a quantity surveyor that passes by and sees it and asks the question, oh, what, what, why do you need this? And then you have a, a, an engineer and a, an operator talking in a classroom environment about the meth methodologies and how they're actually going to do that work. And the simulators basically uh, enable this discussion to occur. So I, my personal experience is I've worked with a lot of operators. I've personally trained with machine control traditionally on site. And we talk, and some of the other guys will probably mention about the people plant interface. And, and in my time when I was training on machine control, I would often be stood on tracks of machines hanging out of a cab window trying to give instruction. And I'm sure that's probably not acceptable on many occasions now. So again, back to the classroom with the simulator, we're enabling this training. And the benefits, the main benefits to it are faster absorption of information. With a younger generation operator, the fear factor drops away, which means they actually listen to the instructions that you're giving them. And then you can actually measure and score them on their abilities and of course, when you do that, the next person wants to know what, what did my, my mate here get? What do I need to do to improve that? So you're giving them good feedback as you go through that. Um, and of course, this, this faster learning uh, cycle is one of the key parts to it. We talked about the people plant interface and clearly there's reduced safety issue with, with the simulators when you use them in this way. Um, and, and we're giving them access to all different types of kit because we work with all of the machine control suppliers out there to do this. And access to this equipment, there are many private and public training establishments up and down the UK that use this technology now. And we as a company have evaluation units that we're more than happy to, to take out and actually demonstrate to people what this is about. Uh, it's very difficult to uh, demonstrate this in these sort of discussions. And it's one of those things that you need to actually uh, try it to fully understand the benefits and understand what it can actually do for you. I hope that answers some of your questions, Saffron. Yeah, that does, Sam, and that's really interesting. Um, you, there's a whole competence di dimension there, which I was aware, you know, you can measure accuracy. But one thing you mentioned there that hasn't occurred to me, I love the th thought of that is like the faster learning cycle, because you can try, you, you know, you can try different things, you can quickly get the feedback. But also, I'm guessing as well, it probably is more efficient um, in terms of the like trainer ratios as well. Yes, well, correct. Yeah, there's uh, you, you depending on how many simulators you have there, you can have multiple operations. You can have ten simulators in a room that actually all interface with each other, which gives a a, re a more real site environment where you've got ADTs, dozers, and three sixties all cooperating with each other. Exactly that. So I guess that must open up that you know I know there's a a, a shortage of skilled operators, so that must mean that there can be a bigger reach with the training. Um, you know, hopefully that'll that'll help to alleviate that. Yeah, um, I must say the people that I've worked with, um, especially younger generation, they'll come to a simulator. I have never driven any of this heavy earthworks equipment. And I would say out of every 10, there's at least two or three in there that have got a natural born ability to do this. And to embrace that and take them through a career path is the critical part. So the simulator in that instance is used as a, a enticing them. It's appealing to the younger generation, but they can make a career out of that. Yeah, that's right. And it's and I think it presents it as a career, not just a, you learn to drive a digger and then sit in a, a digger for the rest of your life. You know, if you're bringing in the digital and exposing them to the, the, the models and the spatial reasoning um, at that early stage as well, then that's going to they're going to be able to visualise where that might lead them um, in a career as well. well that, that's brilliant. Thanks very much, Simon. Thank you. So we'll move on next to Andy Clifton then of Topcon. So, so Andy, you're a senior applications engineer at Topcon GB. So you also work with contractors and plant hire companies with the procurement, fitting out and helping them to get the best out of the machine control. So maybe you could give us a few examples of, of how you do this and maybe take us through how the information is transferred between the site, the project office and then beyond. 
And what happens to this information and what benefits does it bring to the project compared with the more traditional methods of information sharing, like 2D drawings? Okay, yes, yeah, Saffron. Well, hello, everybody, first of all, and, and thanks for, uh, for the warm welcome here this afternoon. And yeah, as, as, as you say there, and, and as the guys have said before, you know, there's been a real big uptake in machine control from all sectors um, in the UK, especially the higher industry as well, uh, which I'm sure Alan's going to touch on a bit more when he gets to his, his part in a bit. But from an operator point of view and a, and a user point of view, it can be quite daunting. And, you know, you, you look at what uh, Gail's mentioned already and Steve's mentioned already, and we're, we're chucking around terminologies about data and, and surfaces and, uh, and what does this all mean? And, uh, you know, Steve mentioned about his, his colleague there, he was, he was worried about taking on machine control because it was going to take over his job. And it's not. It, it's a tool. It's the same as anything else. And the, the operators are used to having, you know, additional sensors, additional buckets, tilt rotators we mentioned there. Why is machine control any different? It shouldn't be. You know, so let, let's simplify it for the operators out there so they demystify the product and, and say what it is. And in its simplest terms, when we're looking at machine control, it, it's like having a sat nav for your dozer. It's telling you where you are, where you need to be, and where you need to, to put that information on site. So it's not there to take away your job. It's there to enhance it. It's to make it easier for you. So when we're looking at data, what, what are we doing? Well, we're, we're we're getting a map, which is the same map that you'd have on your, your sat nav, and we're putting it on a display in the cab. In its simplest terms, that's what it is. And, and I think we need to help operators understand it and demystify uh, that process, as I, as I say. And, you know, if we, if we turn up with uh, your operator who's never used machine control and start talking about surfaces, start talking about different triangulations, and, and off, it, it gets confusing. So I think we need to step back take them from the, the traditional way of, well, there's your 2D plan. That's where you'd have your, your peg and your batter board. This is what a line looks like. And okay, we're now steering to that line. We'll now put what we call a surface in, that would be your batter and, and show the guys as, as they're working, how that looks on site. The fact that we can we can take 2D information and we, we can make it 3D. But I, I think it's, it's an all encompassing situation as well. And I'm sure Mark will mention later on when, when we start talking about data the fact that we need we need to start talking about the same data as well um and and, and get common formats because from the point of view of an operator he wants to be up and running as, as quickly as possible and, and very simply and there's so many different formats flying around and, and i think you know we, we need to as an industry sort of stop <laughs> being in our, our, our manufacturer or our software silos and start coming together you know we, we're coming into a digital age um all job sites are becoming digital and and we need to get that commonality through the through the industry and through the systems to make it as as easy as possible um you know the days of paper are, are gone you know we're, we're in a digital age um this data now is being transferred on the cloud it, it needs to to be that way we're, we're all very comfortable you know sharing files through dropbox or whatever well, we've got the technology there on the machines to do this file transfer and this file sharing now. So let's use it. Um, as Steve mentioned earlier with the kit, we, we can use the operator as a surveyor, as another engineer on the fi in, in the field and feed that data back through the system as well and, ba and back to the engineering team in the office. And as well as being the operator that needs to to, to learn which is you know it's, it's a simple process i think the engineering and the design teams need to also embrace the technology and understand what we need out in the field and 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 what we're actually looking for make that data as simple as possible for the uh, um the, the operator out in the field you know and we've got to move forward we can't go backwards the days of, of paper plans and, and and hammering half a forest of pegs into the field are, are gone um you know we we really need to just embrace it really That's brilliant. Thanks, Andy. That was, um, you, you know, really, really well explained as well. So I think that'll be really useful for people listening back to this as well. Um, brilliant. Thanks, Andy. I move on to, um, to so Mark Lawton of Skanska then. So 
Matt, you're the head of Spain and GIS at one of the leading and most forward-thinking tier one contractors, Skanska. So they work on a lot of the most pre prestigious and high profile and complex infrastructure projects in the UK, you know, delivering major projects on behalf of a lot of the largest clients in the country. So could you take us through how Skanska have adopted machine control technology? What are the main benefits and how does Skanska engage with their supply chain to, to drive the technology? Thank you. Hello, everyone here today and those that are on the record is later. So I'll, I'll just take you through that. 3D EMC is, is not new. Me and Simon met uh, and others have met uh, quite a while ago. I've been doing this since 1996 on optical units uh, before GPS became quite viable. So it, it, it's not new. It's been quite around for a very, very long time. But if I take you through some of those journeys, after the Channel Tunnel, there was the rail link in 2000. We struggled to get it in there because it was a cost into the Olympic Park uh, to deliver the Olympics. It was a cost there. That they had the same excuse. But when it came to M25, I really dug my heels in and said that we're going to have to try and do this uh, because it's going to make things safer, less workers. So we got limited 3D machine control uh, on that site. Then we went into Junction 19, uh, which was in 2016-ish, uh, and something happened, uh, and it what happened external to the machine control world. Well, Highways England banned drone pins. They just banned them overnight because they were busting services. That was a golden moment for me because it meant I would either have to use putty to knock into the ground or I would have to use something different. So I'd have got machine control that I've been trying to push for a long time. So it was easy to adopt by pushing machine control. Then when I went into, uh, into the A14, I was able to mandate this with a level of argument uh, that to get the site to use it. Now, there was a cost there as well where some of the people that saw the advantages of it being safer, less people around the machines, more efficient because they were doing less passes like people just uh, talked about, and, and greener because you'd be burning less carbon. But there were still people in having arguments about, the, well, I can get an engineer to pin this. So just get this thought into your head. Is it a contractor, a supplier, like uh, uh, aggregated industries, turn up with their equipment of machines uh, and, and it, we would have to give them an £100,000 to put these new devices on top. If I was going to pin the A14 and support that machine, I would need three engineers, so I'd call that roughly 30 grand a piece or at 90 grand, I'd have to get three vans, I'd have three elements of risk and then I'd need three instruments. Even in one year, I'd, I'd spent that £100,000 and not had the benefit of reducing people, being efficient uh, and being greener. So straight away, it makes common sense. So the supply chain understand this straight away that they're getting better quality. Uh, the, 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 the pennies dropped with them already. Uh, the engaging part is me mandating it in Highways England. So there's a statement in Raising the Bar that says, on all Highways England sites, you must use 3D machine control for all Earthworks operations unless you have a specific business case. And this is like a policeman stopping you and asking you why you haven't got your seatbelt on. In the past, you could have a good excuse, but now you've got to have a really good re reason for not doing this. Now, as, as an engineer... Uh, this is where the, the things are changing. We need data consistency to come forward uh, to push to the sites. Now, the engineers are going to be starting to get this data, but they don't want to be fiddling around with this data and pushing it to the operator. It needs to be good specifications that can be passed easily to the machine that the operator can use. And then the operators, once there's a specification there out in the open world, uh, in the more building worlds and smaller sites, the operator will be able to pull off a specification and hold it up to their designers and clients. And then linking back to the simulators that we talked about, this is where the future is really touched on, is that, yes, the kids are getting off the Xboxes, they're jumping in the simulators, and they've got those skills. But nobody wants to work from home. We've, we've had a year of this anyway for some people. So simulators and that cable linked to those many machines that Simon talked about is going to be replaced with that cable will be the internet. So will we will have remote piloted machines in the future, just like the drones are piloted flying around Iraq or they're out working in Western Australia. This is going to come. 
but the engineers are going to have to work with this data because straight away, if you find an engineering problem, you can't go back to the designer. You've got to jump in that digital data, work with the operator and say, we didn't realize this tree was here. Let me just change the surfaces and give it back to you. The, the operators are good enough to work around it and work their material. But this is the new skills that the engineers are going to have to lead, uh, learn. So, yeah, so the, the, I like the way you put some numbers into that because I think that's what's going to swing it for most people. It's, and, and it, you know, it took you about less than 30 seconds to demonstrate what, you know, a, the case for machine control by adding up a few numbers there. And um, the other thing that was interesting was that the raising the, the, the raising the bar report, Mark. Um, so maybe if you, I wonder if you could put a link to that in the chat or we could, you know, um, get that information to other people, to people as well. Um, yeah. So, yeah, brilliant. Thanks very much, Mark. So, um, finally, last but not least, and we'll put Alan on last because he can talk for the longest, so he'll just fill up whatever space is, is available. <laughs> no, we'll give you hand signals, Alan, when it's time to stop. Oh, thanks, I'll try my best. So, so Alan, you're you're the um, you're in the training and technical support team at Sunbelt Rentals, and they're one of the leading plant and survey providers in the UK. So, can you tell us then, Alan, how do you get started with machine control technology? You know, if you're new to it, what support is available? Is it expensive to buy? Can you hire it? What are the pain points for plant companies and contractors who are looking to adopt this technology? And what advice would you give them to help them overcome any challenges, perceived or otherwise, that they might face? Thanks, Saffron. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Saffron mentioned, I work for the um, Sunbelt Rentals, the survey division, and dedicate a lot of time helping companies around the UK getting set up for machine control systems for the first time. Um, your first question there, Saffron, how do you get started with machine control? When you want to find out more about machine control, where do you start? Do we need to buy a dozer? What equipment do we need? Do we need a design team? How much will it cost? I would always encourage just sitting down with a supplier or an expert to see how it will best work for you. And that's what's so great about these panel events. You get to find out who these experts are, like ourselves at Sunbelt, like our market Skanska, who you just heard from, people and companies that are prepared to help others take that first step with new technology. And um, support for machine control is always available. It's there from day one, making sure a company has the confidence to invest in it. And it's there in terms of training people so that they become confident in the processes. And I find that supporting machine control is more about the educational path with the people who are investing in it rather than fixing faults or hardware issues that you get with other types of kit. So similar to sort of Steve's example with, it, with his customer at Leica, a great example that I've just had with one of our customers is a contractor I work very closely with in tough construction. They've been using machine control and dozers for years now. And about a month ago, Charlie, who heads up um, their road, their digital construction team basically came to us and said, I want to use machine control in my excavators to dig foundations. These are house plot foundations. I know it can be done, but where do I get started with it? And he was basically looking to us for a bit of support. So together we came up with a plan that involved what system will best suit the job, how to manage the data in terms of what's actually the most efficient way to draw the model, to actually draw the foundations so that it is a seamless flow from office to field. And also at the pinnacle, making sure it is as simple as possible for the excavator driver to use as they're probably new to the technology. So we did some training for the driver and the engineer involved. And one month on, his driver can get in his excavator in the morning. He drives to a plot that doesn't exist yet on the ground and digs the foundation to level. He can create his own offsets, create different layers that need to be put in. And it's just him and his banksman out, out there working away. Although the driver has my phone number and I'm only a phone call away, it doesn't have to call because they went about it the right way. Firstly, they obviously knew who were the people they could ask. And basically they asked. Trading-wise, we focus 
um, our training, machine control training courses on what the engineer or driver will actually be faced with on site. And it can be a beginner or a more advanced driving course, so a driver doesn't have to do all the learning on the job. And I know this is a type of training that you, Saffron, and Gail preach with your setting out for construction courses too. It's focusing on the end users. And the majority of machine control systems now have the ability for remote access. So if a driver or engineer was struggling on site with something, a certain function, we can actually log into their screen and assist straight away without visiting site, which is pretty cool. Um, and of course, people like myself and support teams, a phone call away, we usually get, get abused anyway. Um, in terms of cost for machine control, you asked, is it expensive? If it, if it is decided that machine control can serve a purpose on your site, then when you go about it the correct way, it isn't expensive. And by that, I mean, like, say you're a contractor and you have your own excavators, but you want to use machine control. So you hire an excavator from another, from another company that comes with a driver because it has the system. Then maybe it seems like an expensive operation because your own machine isn't getting utilized or you're using the hired excavator fitted out with the kit. And this could be because the contractor thought this was the only way to use machine control without buying a new excavator and didn't know higher companies like ourselves can supply like plug-in kits that get fitted to your own excavators that do exactly the same job as pre-installed systems, including automatic functions. But you just pay higher rates, which in comparison are small compared to hiring an excavator and a driver. And the man hours that are saved on site, like it's been, it's been touched on before, engineers not having to travel from site to site, the material cost saves, um, the speed of job completion, Using machine control should only save and make contractors money. It becomes expensive if it isn't planned out properly. So the aim for us is eliminating any downtime and unexpected costs. So for example, maybe a contractor doesn't have their own excavator or dozer, so they hire in a machine, which is normal, um, with a driver. But the contractor wasn't aware they needed a base station. So they know now, so they hire a base station. The base station arrives on site, but the engineer hasn't set one up before, so they need assistance with that. Maybe the machine control system in the dozer needs data in a certain format, a format that isn't familiar to the end user, so they need assistance from a support team. Um, and maybe, like Gail said earlier, they might be on a local coordinate system. They haven't worked in these sort of localization files that are, are, are needed. So all these scenarios have the potential to lead to machine downtime, spending money on what now feels like additional tools and potentially paying for third-party help because pressure is now on to get to work because your dozer's been sitting for three days. So now it feels expensive. All this can be prevented by approaching it the correct way, as I mentioned earlier, sitting down with an expert, the supplier, whoever, letting them help you get ready for day one on the job, getting a kit list put together, speaking with the driver and the engineer that will be on site, offering them simple machine control, engineer-based training, GNSS training. When it's done properly, it is 100% a money-making system. Fill kits can be bought and fitted to your own machines, and of course they can be hired, which involves a team of fitters working with a client to go out and get correct systems temporarily fitted to the machine. Um, I touched on it before, it's like a plug-in and play kit. Your last point was, what are the pain points for plant companies and contractors? I can't answer for every plant company, but personally, Mark was talking about like universal data formats and stuff. I get into this because I landed on a site with machine control and I was trying to help the contractor and I thought it was pretty clued in with everything surveyed and there was a, a format that I'd, I'd never heard of before and it ended up costing us quite a lot of money because we never had the expertise so we've been working harder in the last few years to eliminate any pain points by investing in training for ourselves so that we can then pass that on, pass our knowledge to contractors. Of course, it doesn't always work like that. So the main pains would really be just people jumping in at the deep end without speaking to us first. And for contractors, it's all about trusting the supplier and investing in training. It's not exactly pains that occur to them. It's more understandable anxieties that rise, say, an excavator driver who's never used 3D technology or 
an engineer who is maybe expected to know everything, but they've been thrown into the deep end and they've never positioned a base station before or they don't know what a 3D surface is or they've never seen a triangulation. All these things can be taken care of at the very first meeting. And it's where we use our experience and knowledge to make sure when machine control is being used for the first time, it's done right the first time. So hopefully that covers most of what you asked for. Yeah, it does, Alan. Um, so, and what you said there, so basically if you were to hire a kit and you've done all the right planning and you've you've got, all, you know, you've thought about what skills, what other equipment might be needed, et cetera, you know. Yeah, 100%. It just mimics what, what Mark was saying. You know, he gave an example of three engineers. Personally, what I see in Scotland just now, you've got one engineer who, it's not uncommon for them to have three, four, five sites where they're driving around stressed out their box, to put it correctly. And like that, that situation with tough construction, that excavator driver gets up out onto site at half past seven in the morning, goes out into a blank field and digs foundations ready for pouring concrete. With him and a banksman, it, it's, it's definitely the way forward. Um, and... It's a definitely a money-saving system. If for any reason, I would stress that anyone who's had a bad experience with machine control where they thought it was going to be the correct system and it ended up not being financially right for them, just reach out to someone and say, I think we went about it the, the wrong way. What would be your opinion? And just see where it, where it takes you. I think that's another another point worth raising because in the work we're doing to help in SMEs with not just machine control but other kinds of digital enablement, I've, we've come across that they don't that they're reluctant even to pick up the phone and make a call to, to a supplier because they think it's going to open a can of worms. They're going to get railroaded into buying something they don't want. It's going to mean they're going to have to go off and do loads more work and have a long drawn out process but I think the key thing is that it's not it's not like that it's not in the supplier's no. best interest to take that attitude anymore you know it's they are there to help you're not alone in it they're there to help you through that process because like you said Alan cost you money if they yeah. don't get it right so it's yeah. in your own interest to you know give that advice and support freely and people there used to be this this myth, or it wasn't a myth, it was a bit like it, but it used to be Leica, Topcon, Trimble. It, it would be wars between people, but now you've got them sitting in the same panel, offering advice and everyone sharing stories. It, you know, you just reach out and ask for help. And what I find, certainly we do it, you can be speaking to people that you don't even know where they got your number from, but they're like, oh, right, yeah, you would need it in this format. I'll log into your computer for an hour and show you how to do it because it's um, we're here to help. That's what support does. Yeah, that's what we've also found that, you know, like a top con and Trimble all realise that it, there's, there's a role to play there in, in, in raising awareness and increasing the uptake overall. And, you know, there's... Um, it's to everybody's benefit to look at the, the bigger picture. Yeah, but like um, I'll leave on, like uh, Mark was saying as well, I, I look forward to the day where everyone just has allowance for the same data format to go in and out of these kits because it's probably what puts a lot of people off. And, you know, there, there could be an engineer there who's used a Leica total station all his days and then he lands on a site with... Um, Trimble machine control and it, it gets confusing with them and then it puts them off and then there's stresses on site and all of a sudden it, it's got a bad image so there's there's definitely work for manufacturers to help help us the end users out there but I, I do look forward to that day Brilliant, thanks Alan So right, we've got 10 minutes and some questions have come in from the audience so um, the first one is um you know, our plant companies, and I'll just leave this open to, to for any of the panellists to answer. So are plant companies starting to think differently about machine control? Yeah. Look at Lynch. Look at Lynch. Lynch have taken on, on a, uh, an, a new lead of three, 3D machine control. Alpha Beatty plant of a digital plant manager. And I suppose there's other people that do as well. 
So yeah, it's not what? just not just driven by uh, the, 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 the subcontractor or the earthworks contractor, but the plant hire companies are getting on board as well. Yeah, well, you think, Saffron, it, it used to be that someone wants to hire a bit of kit. If you, if you went to Sunbelt, for example, and said, I want machine control, you could get the kit, we would take it out into site, install it, and then hope, you know, it would be, but well, we've hired it to you, you should know how to use that. But we understand it is new technology, so we've got a technical support team with six people in it to support it. You know, it's, and but we're not the only people, there's other companies, the, the, the plant companies that have them on their, their machines don't really have the support t- team, but they'd have the knowledge, but it's a massive thing, you know, everyone's investing in it because we see it as the future. Similar to the laser scanning you were speaking about the other week, it's the same thing. It's a, a division that is just taken off. The more people that see how easy it is to work and the benefits of it in terms of job completion and cost, it will just keep getting more popular. Brilliant. Thanks, Alan. So we've got a, a question from Shane McDaniels. So for an emerging market new to machine control, how, how would the panel see the best way to get contractors and, on, and a, a, operators to a, adopt the technology? You know, what's going to drive this change and who, and who, who what and who, I suppose, um, need, needs to happen for the, the tipping point to happen? I'll put two, I, let me just answer. I put two comments in the chats there. So there's the connecting, a, connecting an automated plant strategy from Iways England uh, there. That's like future gazing. But to even get onto that journey of connecting an automated plant where they're wishing to get to, you've got to have 3D machine control. Uh, so that's one element there. And then there's the raising the bar. That is not done because... Skanska uh, have, have said to do it that's born out of my frustration of, of the poor old machine drivers stuck there with a the tongue out struggling all day long with the machines and my engineers running around putting pins in and not being able to keep up so by having rules uh, specifications written into contract it means that that is the way in for one to be I won't say a stick but, uh, but there's the, the recompense uh, for the people that are coming on board to have machine control. The benefits are there. You will have less people on site around your machines. It will be safer. And you will be more efficient, be on a, a, a large A14 or digging foundations for a warehouse. It, it, it will pay dividends. And then because of your, you're more efficient, your carbon will go down. And you've got to remember that as the newer machines come to be electric, uh, electric, uh, that you'll be able to use this technology regardless of the fuel and you will probably have to do it quicker because you won't have the ba- battery backup like you do have the diesel backup. And this will help towards that. So I would say uh, look it for it to be in specifications and, and then mirror other people that have got it in specifications because it's a better way of working. So putting it in the specifications, and and that's all happening in England. I'm not sure um, where Scotland are with that. That'd be interesting to find out. Does anyone know that off the top of their heads? I'd say they work there in front, aren't they, Alan? Yeah, well, you'd like to think so. I like how um, I like how you put it there. So so simple, Mark. It's, it's better. It's a better way of working. But of course, okay. uh, another thing on that. Um, just to answer Shane's question as well, is that um, the Digital Construction Skills, which is one of the sister companies that um, myself, Saffron and, and Chris work with, um, is ex- the, 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 the reason that Saffron created the company was for exactly that, Shane, was to help companies make that transition and make that decision. So just to give you a little bit of background on it, um, the the project, as I say, Digital Construction Skills was was given uh, a a bit of funding from CITB uh, to help with the the digitalisation of the construction industry. So with that funding, um, as I say, myself, Chris and and, and Saffron have created content. So we've created courses which are free um, to construction businesses that, that want help with how to how to 
make the com company make that transition into digital. So it doesn't always necessarily need to be around machine control. Um, it can be to um, even get you thinking about other digital tools and, and, and uh, processes that are out there that you're maybe not aware of. So again, all those courses are free. Uh, we can even work with you to um, make a business plan. So if, if you do identify yourself that machine control maybe is the right thing for your company, we can help you prepare a business case as well for that. So um, we can post the website on in the chat so that you can have a look at it. But if that if, if you think we could help you in, in any way at all with it, then just get in touch with us. Yeah, that's a good point, Gail. And that, that's all fully funded, what Gail explained then. And I think a lot of um, companies don't realise that they could use the CITV skills and training fund money for this, which is between £5,000 and £25,000 depending on whether you, where you are between zero and 250 employees. So you could basically use that money for machine control, for digital leadership training, for just adding, it's basically for adding new capabilities to your business. So um, if you, there's, there's funding and support available. And, you're not sure. I, can I just add as well, just the, the, the great support we've gotten the from the likes of Leica and Topcon in particular on this project has been first, and Alan there at, at Sunbelt has been first class. So it's not, it's really what, what we're doing, signposting you to the best people in, in the business that we know. And again, I'm just, again, grateful to the panel today as well for coming and sharing their knowledge because I don't think we've got as much, um, you know, there's a hell of a lot of knowledge and experience in this panel today. And I know if you reached out to any of you in some way, you'd be able to help or signpost anyone to the right way, you know, just Absolutely. lift the phone or drop an email. Um, I'm sure I'm speaking for I'm speaking for most of us here anyway. I know like of Andy and Steve or your or your colleagues will, will certainly help. And Alan, you know, Alan, just lift the phone to Alan there, drop Gail an email or just give Saffron a ring. Just takes a half an hour phone call and we, we can do that. So, guys, is there, I think it's we're just about, about, the, about five o'clock now. So is there any, any, anything else we want to finish off on? We'll just, we'll just finish it there or? I'd just like to mention one point um, to, to the audience is uh, on the training aspect of it. I would like to see uh, a category, a recognised category for machine control. Um, so when we look to the MPOs and CPCS standards, to answer, I think it was the earlier question um, about the adoption and what would accelerate it, I see that as, as being a step in the right direction for this without a doubt. And it's We've seen it on many other, you know, lifting categories on excavators. Uh, so when somebody comes to a site, they've actually got a, a passport, as it were, with, that might have a tick in a box for machine control. And if it doesn't, that's where we can come in again with the training aspect. But I'd like to see it recognised. Brilliant. Just be, just, sorry, Chris, just, just before we go, I've noticed that we've, there's a comment from Fiona Jack. I know we've not got really time to answer it. But Fiona, if, if you want... Um, just send me an email. Chris has popped my email address in the chat box there, um, and I, I can I can discuss that with you. Yeah, brilliant. Just I know I wanted to come up to Steve briefly, but Simon, just before you go, uh, what about um, the, the likes of simulators and further education colleges? Obviously, there's a big focus on you know upskilling as well. Is that something that you know that you've seen a big uptake in that, or is it still a, a bit of a gap there as well? No, I'd say there's uh, a good seventy percent of our business is actually with FE and HE. Um, oh, that's that's good. That's 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 really encouraging to hear. That that's really good. Steve, you you had your hand up there. Just to to touch on yeah um, about what can be done to to boost the the uptake of machine control. I think between health and safety, uh, carbon reduction, the need to compete, um, and positive word of mouth. I mean. The smaller the, the SMEs tend to, you know, everybody talks. And if if the, the the people that have adopted it are having a positive experience, and if if we are all doing our jobs properly, they will be having a positive experience. Um, then, yeah, it's only a matter of time. I recall being on on a site not too long ago, um, before all the restrictions, and a, a building inspector just said, "This is the fortieth site I've been on this week, and this is the only one." using 3D machine control. Jeez. Why? Why isn't everybody using it? And that was a building inspector with no, you know, no affiliation to uh, any manufacturers, just saw the benefits and, uh, yeah, it was just a brilliant comment. So I think it's just a match of time. Brilliant. Brilliant. 
Okay, guys, we'll, we'll not keep you much longer. I know everyone's tea time for everyone as well, but I, I really th- thanks to everyone to, today for your for your contributions. That's been absolutely brilliant, and um, and and thanks thanks Mark, Alan, Steve, Andy, Gail, and Simon, and thanks Saffron for for hosting that event today. And I hope everyone um, enjoyed that today. And um, well, I'll, I'll I'll pop this up um, either later today or tomorrow uh, to to watch and listen or listen again. Okay. So Brilliant. thanks everyone for coming. Thanks. And I appreciate that. Bye. Take care. Cheers. All the best. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 <laughs>
Alcon's machine control has helped me with its simplicity and its efficiency. Uh, what has been key is that I've been able to work in my normal way of working and all the people I work with, but then we've been able to cassette all that information together, put it into 3D Office and then convey that out to the work site in a seamless manner. Basically, get the data, package it up, send it out to the machines. I can't get a surface detail up, so I've messaged him back saying that there's a problem, I haven't got a surface detail. Then I get another map update with the surface detail in it, and that's fixed. That's a nice touch. I've been on machines 20, 25 years. I've used other systems before, and it was, it was hard work to start with. But then I came across Topcon, and it became much easier. By having a simple system, you will have efficient processes, and there's no adding on of extra work needed. It's just simple and efficient data workflows, and that's what Topcon's brought. It's taken labourers out of the way, it's taken chain boys out of the way. With this system, there's no need for them to be there. They can sit quite comfortably in an office and send me the files that I need. I don't need them around. It's a risk that Topcon has taken away. The materials that you use, wood, the damage to the materials, the setting out errors, a lot of those are eradicated straight away. I think SiteLink is a good choice because it's simple. It is very easy to pick up. You can pick it up within an hour. You don't need no fancy buttons. You get the information in, working in the way. Put in your digital terrain model, put in your line work, and put your localization file, and just push it out to the machine. It's as simple as that. There's an opportunity to say, uh, let's lift the pilot mat, or take the pilot mount, or slacken the batters. That's an engineering operational decision that needs to be done quickly. Then we will go and you site link, go back to the office, do the necessary checks, and upload it in minutes. That's where Silent really pays dividends. Well, thanks for watching, and please get in touch if you need help or information on any Topcon solution.